before we get started on the subject material of this video, I have a request. I think it's a pretty reasonable one. Before you check out from the content of this video, it would be nice if you could spend just a little time subscribing and liking it. Now, if you don't like the video, I would like you to, to say in the comments section below why you didn't like it. That is as helpful to us as the like and subscribe because it will give us an opportunity to see where we may be not meeting your expectations and it will help us to do better next time. But please do something. Subscribe and like is what we would like you to do. So go for it. Now back to our original programming. We are going to look at the restrictions in the intake system or in the entire through flow system of the engine and identify where the worst restrictions take place and fix those first. So let's uh, start with the first uh, uh, deal here just to make my point. Almost every video you watch on YouTube concerning porting cylinder heads, especially Ford and Chevy small block heads, is to enlarge the pinch point. The pinch point is not the disadvantage. As I showed in one of my previous videos, that the pinch point is actually far more efficient than the rest of the port, especially around the valves. So we're going to look at that now. First, let's analyze what we're dealing with here. Let's take a look at the bowl work we need to do. As I have said, the bowl is one of the most important parts along with the de-shrouding uh, of the chamber here. We'll deal with that in another section. For now, we'll deal with this part of the bowl here. First, this side here. Before I move on though, I do have um, a couple of uh, emails from a guy in California, at least I think he's in California. Uh, Trevor Rayner. So if this is, if you're Trevor Rayner in California, this is for you. You've asked a couple of times, do I always use these scat rods? And if I had to step up, what would I use? Well, as most of you know, I build high output street engines and even at a thousand horsepower uh, for a drag race motor, we haven't broken one of these. But if the budget goes for it, this rod here, again it's a scat rod. Yeah, I know Richard, you're going to say not another scat rod. Well, it is. It's a scat rod. It's a little more money than that, but it's lighter and it's made uh, of, of a superior uh, uh, steel, right? But I want to be plugging scat rods left, right and center here. I use a lot of them because they're value for money but there are a lot of other rod companies out there, right? Good manufacturers, Crower, Cosworth, uh, my mind's gone blank, at least a half a dozen. Oliver, uh, what else? Uh, oh, and I'm gonna look at some aluminum rods, right? There, there's some new metallurgy deals uh, that um, have been out, they've been out for probably 20 years now, but. They, they've not hit much of a highlight in the rod business, but uh, this um, alloy is it's a scandium alloy. Um, I was in on the uh, uh, introduction of it to, to West from Russia. 98% of the scandium in the world's uh, mined in, uh, within 30 miles of Kiev. Anyway, the thing is, is that um, it'll step up the fatigue resistance of a good aluminum alloy by 600%. So suddenly, aluminum rods are taking on a slightly new meaning, but another time. We'll deal that with another time. 
Right now what I should do is rather than start on the bowls uh, like uh, I, I just did in a couple of scenes back, I need to explain to you what the intake port or what constitutes an intake port and why the bowl is so uh, important. So we'll do that right now. I know a lot of you have seen port molds like this, this is an example. This here is a um, port mold of the AFR, uh, not the Renegade, Enforcer, their new budget one, right? And, uh, and they make sense, right? And this is what you see as the intake port here. But the reality is, let me get this from behind that trip flow head, which darn it, I'll get to doing that as soon as I can. I want to build a five liter one of those I'm going to show it versus the three valve engine right but here is an intake port tuned for about 7000 rpm that goes from the valve to either the plenum which appears to be open air as far as the uh, intake port is concerned or it ends in a ram stack i.e open air now this port would have been uh, situated like this and it was a cross ram like this Australian touring car now we're going to look now th let me say this port has uh, it can't be made anything closer to ideal than than this generally speaking because there are certain rules which uh, it has to abide to so it's not an ideal port so what I'm going to do now is show you a very basic ideal port configuration. So let's go to the computer. Here is our idealized port. You'll notice we don't have a valve guide or a valve in there. If you want to learn about a, a, an idealized port with a valve in it, I suggest you go and check out my um, Paratech episode concerning the coefficient of discharge. There you'll see an experimental straight port like this, complete with valve. Now, what is the most important number other than CFM, and it's about equally important, is the discharge coefficient of the port. Now that's a fancy way of saying it's flow efficiency. So let's get to it. We're going to really look into this in depth. Now, let's look at this in a little more detail here. Here's where we build up the velocity in the port. We don't try and accelerate the air right up to maximum speed instantly, but start off with it coming around a radius here. Keep the radius uh, not too large because if it gets too big, it damps out the pressure wave tuning, as does having too much taper on this here. It would appear that somewhere between 1 and 2 degrees is optimum for this and the radius here on your typical uh, uh, V8 engine uh, induction system doesn't need to exceed about 3 8 of an inch diameter max otherwise it starts to get negative. Anyway we build up speed in this. Oh and by the way this taper makes this look shorter so that may be eight inches from there to there but with that two degree taper it'll act more like it's about six and a half seven inches right now when the air gets into here it's acquired its maximum velocity that it's going to acquire and this has been named by kevin at uh, motorcycle enthusiast he's the technical editor uh, he did a, um, uh, a seminar at the superflow conference uh, in Colorado Springs many years ago and he named this the energy bucket and I thought that's a good name we'll stick with it from here it goes into the bowl I uh, again this is a stylized bowl it's not going to be quite that shape now we know that as velocity goes here it's going to slow down in do so doing it converts the kinetic energy that's in here 
to some pressure energy there. In other words, the pressure goes up here, which of course will help it go past the valve seat. So that's one thing there. Translating the kinetic energy here to pressure energy here helps the discharge coefficient, especially at the end of the induction stroke. Now, you might say, well, why don't we just make this bigger? Well, this is a highly efficient shape. It's a straight tube. There is no point in this being any bigger than the maximum that this can flow, right? If we were to flow test just the seat independently, we would find that any port diameter bigger than the seat can manage to flow serves no useful purpose other than to drop the power so that your teenager kids can drive the car safely, right? We're not there. Now then, the other thing is, <clears throat> if you're driving a race car, you'll know this, especially a road racer. If you want to get around a corner, best thing to do is to slow up. Well, this plays into our hands here, right? So now let us look at what constitutes something near a real port here. Well, here's the port in a more familiar form. I haven't put the tapered section in up here, just don't have room. But here, you can see this diameter here, all the way to there, constitutes the energy bucket. From here on, round here, the area is increasing. This area here is quite substantially bigger than this here. Typically 20 to 25 percent. Now, what do we have to make allowances for for this turn? Firstly, we need to have the guide boss skinned down and streamlined as much as possible because it's a pain in the butt and it always gets in the way. So that's the thing there. Plenty of room either side of the guide boss and don't forget it needs to be wider to make up for the width of the guide boss itself. So you can see how the air slows down to come around here. Now we got a pretty large short side turn here and I'm sure your immediate reaction would be that oh the air ought to be able to make it around that corner. Well I've got some bad news for you. After about 125,000 lift on your typical V8 head, the air does not make it around this corner. Some does, but the flow is more like across like this. It's good to remember that because certain things will need to be adjusted. For instance, since the bulk of the flow takes place in this half of the valve here, this actually needs to be a larger radius for the air to go around than on this side. We can actually uh, put quite a tight turn just before that there and there. Now then, you can see that as the air comes down here, it slows, helping it to get around the corner. I say that helping it to get around the turn uh, sounds like it gets a whole lot better. It doesn't. In spite of this opening here, the bulk of the air still wants to go across like this. You'll see at full valve lift, there's something like twice the amount of air coming out that side as there is this side. And this is a pretty generous radius. So, the biggest gains we get from this is not the fact that we're taking the turn, but the fact that we are increasing the pressure in this area here, right? That's where it's going. Now let's look at an end view of the port. What you see here, is an end-on view of the port. This here is the manifold face opening, so it's at the back of this picture. Now you can see that as the air comes by the guide, we increase the width of the port quite substantially here, right? And since this is the cylinder wall side here, right? The air at high lift is going to want to go out and past the valve like this. The valve head will be 
down here somewhere right it will do what I call windowing round and out that's when we start to get the uh, discharge coefficient climb again past the 0.25 D valve lift mark now the last bit of the uh, actual video I was saying uh, this is how you should uh, do the short the uh, side of the bowl on the cylinder center side this radius here needs to be kept small all the way to where it is immediately at the bottom of the bowl what we don't want is and you if you look down the port you'll see that there's a tendency for the shape to guide the air across like this well it's going to fight the air coming across here if you look at a vortex cylinder head you will find that this wall here from the port coming down to here is nearly square and this is a very small radius here so that the air coming around here gains very little in the way of velocity going over that way it's coming straight down or more or less straight down and gets it more easily deflected across the port like that now you'll notice how much this is bulged out here right two reasons a lot of air wants to come this side of the guide and two we need to slow it down so that it can come out of here that is the importance of the bowl if we don't slow it down right we are going to lose flow now you may well ask how the rest of the industry treats the uh, design and development of the bowl in relation to the rest of the port well strange as it may seem I've actually seen pro stock head porters advocate a pure taper from the intake plenum right the way to the valve and these pro stock head porters have been successful they've set records but I suspect they'd set records even better if they were doing the port as I suggest here and and you might say what have I got to tell pro stockers right if they're winning races well the th the truth of the matter is my pro stock uh, design of heads have won races I've had people come to my seminars that now pro, pro stock champions who now do their ports as per DV and they're going faster for it so what I'm saying is is those Pro stock headporters who aren't doing this are leaving something on the table. How much? Could be about 2% of the power, right? Now that doesn't sound like a lot, you wouldn't feel it, but it sure would show up on the clocks and your speed uh, through the traps. Okay, there's a couple of people I do want to mention here. A um, friend of mine, Chad Spears is a very experienced cylinder head porter and he gets really frustrated as hell when people just quote the port CC's as a reference to what the port characteristics are. Well it's better than nothing but Chad's right here it's not a question of how many CC's there are in a port it's a question of where they are right. Um, the, the one that gives you the most energy is the one that has a higher proportion of the port cc's contained within the bowl. Now I said a higher proportion. That doesn't mean you gotta try and get 50% of all the cc's there. No, what you should do is try modifying the heads using my IOP program because that will put the volumes right where they need to be if you follow exactly what it's trying to tell you there. Well, that about f finishes off our video for today. Uh, let me say, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And please, if you don't like something, tell us why and do it politely and please do it under your own name, right? I post here under my own name. Like I said, I own everything that I post. If I'm wrong, I'll face up to it. 
right? But those people who post under a pen name, when they're proved wrong, they kind of sneak away and disappear. Don't respect that very much. Don't be one of those. If you don't like something, tell me why and we'll sort it out in a gentlemanly fashion. Thank you for watching.